Let's hold our Bibles up. If you have your Bible, hold it up now so we can see it. If you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'll do the best we can to get you one. Father, we thank you for the Word, and we ask you to minister to us and teach us today. And we come to you hungry. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping, of sowing and giving, of fellowshipping together, all kinds of fun and activity, building new relationships. But we want to leave here changed, and the Word of God will change us. And so, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody say it. Amen. All right, turn around and tell somebody you have miracles coming your way. And let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 8, if you would. And oh, I ask the Holy Spirit to help me today. And the title of this message is A Man Named Saul. Let's say together, A Man Named Saul. I remember the message last night was a step of yes. And many of you stepped forward last night receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of you came forward last night for prayer. And we call this our altar. Now, an altar can take on a lot of different forms, but it means a meeting place with God. You can have an altar in your house. You can have an altar in your vehicle. You can have an altar at church. It's a meeting place. It's a place where you can meet with God. And we can establish an altar anywhere. Acts chapter 8, there's a man by the name of Saul that has come on the scene. And sometimes when we read the Bible, you can turn the keyboard down for me just a little bit. Thank you. In these monitors right here. Sometimes when we read the Bible, it's a little hard maybe at times to really relate to what's happening, to make it personal as if you were there. But in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, there's a man named Saul. He's very intelligent. He's highly gifted. He's a religious leader of the day, and he has a mission. He thinks his mission is right, but it's not. He's persecuting the church. They're not persecuting people that worship pagan gods. They're not persecuting people that sacrifice babies and throw them in fires while they're alive to try to appease a pagan god. They're persecuting Christians, those who love the Lord Jesus Christ, those who trust in him for their salvation and eternal life and all that he has done. Those that serve their communities and love their communities and love one another, they're persecuting them. The church has exploded into birth in Acts chapter 2. Thousands are being saved on a daily basis. Miracles are taking place. You would think everyone would be happy because miracles are occurring. Crippled people are walking, blind eyes are being opened, the church is growing, communities are being impacted in a positive way, but not everybody's happy. Because of Jesus in their lives and the use of the name of Jesus, they're now being persecuted. That means at any moment, Someone may knock on your door or just bust it down and come in. That means at any moment, your parents could be taken to prison, persecuted, beaten, tortured. If they don't deny Christ, they could be martyred. The church, the children that were part of families that were Christian could find themselves orphaned could find themselves alone, could find themselves in the street. A man by the name of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, he's a godly man. He's loved by the body of Christ. He serves and takes care of the body of Christ. He's full of the Holy Spirit and he moves with power. Signs and wonders follow his life. He has been martyred in Acts chapter 7. And while he's being martyred, he's preached a message about Christ. While he's being martyred, he sees a vision of Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. While he's being martyred, he forgives those that are stoning him and killing him. While he's being martyred, he's forgiving those that are taking his life. A lot of times as Christians here in America, we sometimes just are not aware 
of how difficult it is for others who have received Christ, who really, biblically, truthfully, are our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Our family throughout the world often suffers. Many of them are persecuted. The offering we gave today will be used to buy food for people in nations where persecution is quite common. In some of those nations and some of the pictures you were shown, we see, we see smiling, happy faces because food has been delivered. Some of those pictures, those people are going to carry those, those bags of rice, 50 and 100 pounds. They'll strap them on and attach them to the, like the forehead and carry those up into the mountains. Some of them many thousands of feet high. They're taking food to people that are suffering. Acts chapter 8 verse 1, Saul was consenting unto the death. Of the one being martyred, Stephen. He called on God and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and he cried to a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said that, he fell asleep, the Bible says, which means he died. And Saul was approving of all this. At the time, there was great persecution against the church, which is in Jerusalem. And the Christians were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The apostles stayed there and stayed strong. Some Christians did too, but the gospel began to spread. Devout men, men that loved God, no doubt loved Stephen, carried his body to burial. And it says in verse 3 that Saul made havoc of the church. He entered into every house, hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they were scattered. And everywhere they went, they preached, they proclaimed, they told people the word of God. They had the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness and to tell people how Jesus transformed their lives, even in the middle of challenges, difficulties, and hard times. Let's reach up and grab a hold of that if you would. We may not live in a situation like that, but being a Christian sometimes presents itself with many challenges. People may mock you and make fun of you. They may put you down. They may not be able to believe that you believe and trust in Christ for your soul, for your salvation, for eternal life. They may not like the convictions you live by because you've chosen to do your best by the grace of God to do what's right, to treat people kindly to be respectful of others, to be respectful of property. You chose to not throw your trash on the ground because you chose to honor. You chose to not swear or curse or do other things that destroy your temple. Acts chapter 9, this Saul of Tarsus, in chapter 1, he's going to have an encounter with the Lord. He's going to experience a moment of grace in his life. And it says... He was still breathing out and threatening and slaughtering against the church, the disciples of Christ. He went to the high priest and got authority, written authority, to persecute Christians and bring them in and imprison them. He thought he was doing right. He probably had a very large portion of the Bible memorized, the Old Testament, if not all of it. He knew about God, but he didn't know God. He did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the only begotten Son of God. He did not believe that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. Therefore, he was persecuting what he didn't understand. And as he went near Damascus to find more Christians, persecute more Christians, to imprison more Christians, Suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. This morning as I was in prayer, I was reading many stories of youth and children, your age and younger, that suffer terribly, that are persecuted. Not only because they're Christians, but just because they live in a certain area. 
sometimes kidnapped and used for horrible exploits, sometimes forced into military situations. We live a life that's quite sheltered and very blessed. Now hold your hand out and say this with me. I'm blessed so I can be a blessing to others. I'm blessed so I can be a blessing to others. In the book of Acts, in a certain area, there's a great famine. And there are Christians that live in the area of that famine. As we stand here today, blessed, and yes, in America, I think they say one in six may go to bed hungry, but we're not starving. Hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of people are facing famine right now throughout the world, and many are facing starvation. And Paul is en route to do what he thinks is right, but he has an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 9, verse 4, the Bible says he fell to the earth. He's having an encounter with Christ, and he fell to the earth. Sometimes the presence of God will manifest itself in such a way that we can't stand. Sometimes the presence of God, his presence will manifest himself in such a way that we just can only fall to the earth. Sometimes it may bring us to tears. Sometimes the presence of God may bring us to great joy where we actually just lift our hands and celebrate and thank the Lord for what he's done. But in this situation, Saul of Tarsus fell to the earth, a man named Saul, and his life is about to forever be changed because he has an encounter with Christ. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. And the Lord speaks to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. Who, have you, who you've been persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. Now, as far as we know, Saul of Tarsus never met Jesus. What is Jesus saying? When you persecute the church, when you attack the church, you're attacking him. And it's hard to kick against the truth. The message you just heard from Stephen, who is born again, received Christ as the Messiah. And folks, when we receive Christ as the Messiah, he not only enables us to love one another, he gives us grace to forgive our enemies, to pray for our enemies, to even love those that persecute us. God, I believe, wants to take the church to a higher level than we've ever been before. And who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And trembling and astonished, what would you have me to do, Lord? And the Lord said, Arise and go into the city. It shall be told of thee what thou must do. I believe that Saul of Tarsus has begun a salvation experience right here, the grace of God intervening in his life. He begins to call Jesus Lord. And when he gets up, he will be blind and others will lead him into, the, into Damascus. And God is preparing a disciple to go minister to him. Now, this is not a prophet. This is a disciple. And if you're a believer, say it with me. I'm a disciple. I'm a disciple of Christ. I follow Christ. I do the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my Savior and he's my Lord. And the Lord tells Ananias, go into Damascus gives him specific instructions in verse 11. Arise and go to the street called Straight. Inquire the house of Judah for a man named Saul. He's from Tarsus, and he is praying. He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias, and this man would come to him, put his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Ananias said, I've heard of this man. He persecutes the church. You sure you want me to go minister to that man? Say it with me. Yes. The Lord loves everybody. Jesus died on Calvary's cross for every person in the world. God is going to send someone to share the gospel with our enemies. The Lord is going to send someone to minister Christ to terrorists. God's going to send someone to minister to people we're having a hard time loving. 
And sometimes the Lord will send us to minister to them. You want me to do what, Ananias said? Go minister to the man that persecutes the church. Go minister to the man that scattered the church, divided the church, broke up homes and families. Go share with him. Go minister to him. Go lay your hands on him. Go prophesy over him. And the Lord began to speak to him. He said, I've chosen this man to be a vessel unto me. Reach up and grab a hold of that. That's what God has done with you. He's chosen you to be a vessel unto him. As we come to the altar, as we come to receive from the Lord, many of you came forward last night. Some of you chose to stay in the area where you were sitting to worship, and that's perfectly okay. You come when you perceive the Holy Spirit's drawing you, and you just come up here hungry for God. I tell people receiving what God has for you is like taking a drink of water. How many of you know if you take a drink of water, you got to lift the glass to your mouth, you got to open your mouth, you got to stop talking, and you have to tip the glass and swallow. It takes involvement on your part. And when you come to the front and people that we've released to pray, I'd like to ask you, if you would please, though we know you know each other and you have relationship, we just ask for our pastors or someone we may call up. Like last night, I had Pastor Pablo and his wife come. You help us to minister with people on the line. We know you. That makes it a safe place. If you would like to pray with one another or you as leaders like to pray for someone in your group, we believe in body ministry, but just come get a pastor here, one that is working on the line, and we'll come with you so that we know you all know each other and that everybody's in a safe place. And when you begin to receive from the Lord, it's just like drinking a water. Say it again, it's just like drinking water. Just begin to receive in your spirit what God has for you. Some may stand, some may fall. Some may weep, some may shout. Some may stand there in silence as strong as an oak tree. Just receive because we receive by faith. There may be a variety of manifestations. There may be none, but we receive by faith. Just come expecting God to touch you because when you come to meet with God, God comes to meet with you. He's already there. He's already wooing you. He's already calling you. His desire is to help prepare you for what he's called you to for your future. Be it whatever your ministry may be in whatever capacity of job or situation that he has called you to, he'll prepare you and equip you. And the Lord said to Ananias about Saul of Tarsus, he's chosen vessel unto me. He will bear my name. He will declare my name before the Gentiles. He'll stand before kings. He'll also share my name before the children of Israel, the Jewish people. For I will show him great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now reach up and grab a hold of that. And the church in America doesn't really want to hear much about suffering. When we begin to mention the idea of suffering, we often push that away. And Ananias went, entered into the house, put his hands on Saul. He began to speak to him, the Lord Jesus that appeared unto you on the way as you came to Damascus has sent me that you might receive sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now say it with me, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now Saul of Tarsus, before this encounter with Christ, before he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, was willing to kill the church was willing to martyr the church, was willing to separate and break up families and put people in prison that would not deny Christ. Before Jesus, before Holy Spirit, he was willing to kill the church. But now after he's received the Holy Spirit, which was after he received Christ, now he's willing to die for the body of Christ. He's willing to die if need be just in sharing the gospel with people that don't know the Lord. How many of you know that's pretty radical? A man named Saul, before Holy Spirit, he was one thing. After Holy Spirit, he was another. Now, I'd like for you to say this with me. I need the Holy Spirit. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the second letter, 
chapter 11. I'd like to read this. I did mention from this last night, and I would like to read from it again. This is his encounter with Christ. Always remember those special times when the Lord meets you and the Lord speaks to you. God can speak to us every day throughout the day, but there are monumental times in our lives. This was a monumental moment for Saul. He would from this point be known as Paul. He would become an apostle. He would share Christ with everyone that he was, came encounters with, Jews and Gentiles in Damascus. He later on went to Jerusalem. People were still afraid of him. But Barnabas came along, an apostle, trained him, helped disciple him, befriended him, and stood as a witness. This man is really born again. This man has been changed. This man has received the Holy Spirit. This man will suffer much for the sake of the gospel. I believe God wants to bless us. I believe God wants to prosper us. And I believe God wants to strengthen us even in challenging, hard times when we may be suffering. Sometimes suffering involves sticks and stones and beatings. Sometimes it involves imprisonment. And sometimes it involves critical harsh words or being made fun of or mocked. It's important we have relationships in the body of Christ. So in those moments of suffering, we can encourage one another. We can pray for one another. We can stand with one another. We can be there in times of trouble. Can I hear an amen? It's important that we don't turn our back on one another, but we remain loyal in our relationship and our friendships, even if we have a disagreement, even if we don't see the same way on a certain situation, we should still love one another. We should still honor one another. We should still prefer one another. And the world should see us and say, those people follow Christ. You can tell. How can you tell? Jesus said, by the way you love one another. The world will know you're Christians by the way you treat one another, the way you love one another. There was a professor in a Muslim nation, and in Muslim nations, oftentimes Christians are persecuted. In this nation where this man was a professor, Christians are persecuted. And he noticed in, one of his in some of his classes that there are some people in that class that don't behave like everyone else. There are some people in this class that treat one another differently than anyone else. And he decided, I want to know what it is that causes these people to treat each other so kind and so nicely. And as he got close to them where he could begin to understand, the government moved him to another university. When he went to that university, he saw the same thing in his classes. There are some people here that just aren't the same. They treat people differently. They treat one another differently. And he was able to get close to them, build a relationship with them, and they were Christians, and they led him to the Lord. When it was known he'd become a Christian, he lost his job. He was beaten terribly and thrown into prison. And as Christians intervened from America to help, he was released from prison and able to come to America Praise the Lord. People are watching you. People are watching us. And they should be able to tell that we're Christians by the way we treat one another. Even if we don't agree totally on the, on the same issue, we still love each other. We don't divide and separate just because we don't have the same point of view. When you take that position before long, you'll be standing all alone. But when you take the position to love, to honor, to prefer, you'll always be connected and God will be able to bless you in a powerful way. Paul wrote to Corinthians and he was telling them about some of the things he had suffered. Welcome to Christianity. Though I do not expect all of us to experience this, some will though they are probably rare, but you will experience some suffering. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant in stripes above measure, in prison, more frequent in death often. 
Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, 195 lashes on his back and body, scarred. If you'd have seen Paul without his garment on, his shirt on, his back, his neck, his ribs, his shoulders, his arms were scarred. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I suffered a shipwreck, and night and day I've been in the deep, in journeyings, in perils, in water, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils of heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren. When I've been weary, I've been in pain, toil, in hunger and thirst, fasting often, sometimes very cold, sometimes in nakedness. Beside those things that are on the outside causing pressure, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Would you say it with me, the care of all the churches? What changed this man? What caused this man to move from being a persecutor of the body of Christ it brought martyrdom to the body of Christ. What changed him that he was willing to die to share the gospel message? What changed him that he would go through all these things to continue his ministry, to never stop? It was Acts chapter 9. It's an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to say this with me. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. When you have met Christ, and when you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll never be the same again. Let's say it together. We will never be the same again. I hope and pray by the grace of God, I never deny Him. I hope and pray by the grace of God, I'll always obey Him. I hope and pray by the grace of God, I'll go anywhere He sends me, anytime He sends me, and say whatever He tells me to say. I pray by the grace of God that I'll stay connected to him and connected to the body of Christ. Continue to love them, care for them, strengthen them, minister to them, and help them in every way I can, even if they don't agree with me and I don't agree with them. I still am going to choose the path of love. When Jesus ascended to be with the Father and seated at the right hand of God, he had already told his disciples several times say it with me the holy spirit the holy spirit will come the comforter will come i must leave so the comforter can come you need the holy spirit like i need the holy spirit if i don't leave the holy spirit can't come but holy spirit came the disciples were concerned about politics they were concerned about their nation they wanted invaders driven out. And they were asking Jesus, when will you establish your kingdom on the earth? When will you rule and reign as king in Jerusalem, in Israel, and drive our enemies away? And Jesus, though he had been trying and ministering along this line for three years, he in essence says, that's not what you need to know now. What you need now is the Holy Spirit. Can I hear an amen? Say it with me. What I need is the Holy Spirit who will lead me and guide me and remind me of the things that Jesus taught me. I need the Holy Spirit so that I can operate in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, meekness, self-control, and more. I need the Holy Spirit so can I can operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and minister with power so people can come out of bondage come out and be delivered. Come on, somebody. Healed and saved. If you're here today or watching us online and you suffer torment, nightmares, horrible dreams, fear, God wants to set you free. Jesus came to bring deliverance, freedom, and salvation. Can I hear an amen? It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power when? Say it with me. After, after the Holy Spirit comes. You'll receive power, Jesus said, after the Holy Spirit comes. When did Paul receive power? After the Holy Spirit came. 
And I want you to say this with me. I need the Holy Spirit. I need baptized in the Holy Spirit. I need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I need the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I need filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit. Let's all stand together. The worship team would come back. We'll close here in a few minutes. I believe God wants to put a hunger in us for the Holy Spirit. God, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an absolute baptism of love. Can I hear an amen? You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. That's like saying in Lafayette, in Indiana, in America, and all the nations. Simultaneously, you shall be a witness. That means you'll be empowered by the Holy Spirit to verbally declare and speak with your words from your heart. Now, meeting the Lord Jesus Christ has transformed your life. I want you to say it with me. I have a testimony. I have a testimony. People told me God does not want to prosper you. That's not true. Yes, it is. It's Bible. He wants to bless me and prosper me, put in my hand everything I need to do what God called me to do. Jesus doesn't heal today. Some may say, yes, he does. You'll never talk me back into sickness or back into poverty. When I'm sick and poor, I can't share the gospel. I can't do anything. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life to help me recover, help me be blessed so that I can reach out and minister to other people. I believe. Say it together. I believe. I believe. I trust the Lord with all my heart. You shall receive power to do what? Say it with me. Be a witness. God has anointed us for such a time as this to be a witness. If the worship team would come back, we're going to worship for just a few moments. And while we worship, let's prepare our hearts to receive from the Lord. And if the Holy Spirit draws us when we open up time to come to the altar, you come. And you be hungry and you be ready. And all the church said, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your presence here today. We come before you hungry. We come before you desperate. We thank you that the Holy Spirit has come. And we see that the Holy Spirit changed Saul of Tarsus and made him Paul. Changed him from being one that would destroy the church to one that would become willing to die for the body of Christ. Willing to die so others might come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. That's a hunger we long, that we desire. We want to move from one place to the other, and we know we can only do it by way of Holy Spirit. So we take a moment to worship you. We ask you, Lord, to seal these words in our heart. And all the church said, amen. Turn around and tell someone, the Holy Spirit is a life changer. Let's worship for just a moment, and we will come open the altars and release you to go and begin your meal and your fellowship. God bless you.